We are so thrilled to be able to do an opening of anything <laughs> in, in this tumultuous time, but really thrilled to be celebrating as part of the Chesapeake Heartland Project, the Kent Cultural Alliance Arches Fellowship Program with our five wonderful artists. So I can just go quickly around the room. The Ceramic Mural Diptych by Mike Pugh. Wonderful series of then and now photographs by Gordon Wallace. <laughs> Extraordinary personal memories of life oystering on the Chester River by Alan Johnson. <laughs> Loss, Lost, and Lose. Digital images by the artist Bogey. <laughs> and then finally, stunning portraits of Jason Patterson. Chesapeake Heartland is an African-American humanities project and the purpose is to preserve, digitize, and make accessible and also to interpret African-American history to the community. The Kent Cultural Alliance is essentially our county arts council. Our primary role is the redistribution of public funds to support artists, arts organizations, and artistic endeavors. We actually talked to the community about uh, one or two years before the project started to get a strong idea of exactly what the community wanted. And that is extremely important because so often other cultures, other people want to interpret our history without including us. You know, so often when you find out African American history, you find that it shows the downtrodden experiences, but we have so many more experiences that we want to highlight into the world that yes, we were downtrodden, we did have and still have a very difficult time, but despite all this, we've developed our own culture and, and it's a very rich culture. This fellowship was awarded to five local artists and each of them has had the opportunity to spend time with the archive, select a story or an image or an artifact that really meant something to them, take that and further expand on it through some form of artistic expression. Partnering with the Kent Cultural Alliance, it's a time for all of us working together. We're like merging African American history and bringing it alive. I really wanted to get in on this because I felt like this collection of stories and this archive was really going to be about African American stories from Kent County. And it's always been my sort of understanding that the best way to tell stories and to get more people engaged in these stories is through the arts. When you're working with the arts, it just brings it alive. It kind of sinks it in your mind a little bit better what's going on. We've got five great artists with very different backgrounds and of course bringing different media to the project. Kent Cultural Alliance is an ally with us and we're all working together to portray and interpret the history. There were so many different organizations, the Black Panther Party, and then there was Elijah Muhammad, and Malcolm X, and Martin Luther King. I I'm sure you can remember that, can't you? Back in the 60s? Mm. Uh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. actually, none yeah. of us can. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, was I forget that I'm 80. <laughs> Alan Johnson, what an artist in this community. He's a painter and a sculptor and in his more than 80 years on this planet, he has created some extraordinary work, most of which he sold, so we don't even have access to it. We're thrilled to have pieces by him that actually go back to stories of him as a child working on the water, oystering with his dad. I started sketching at first when I was seven years old. My first grade teacher, she inspired me to just keep on painting. I can remember one occasion when she says, Alan, the sky is not orange. And, and uh, I had painted a little orange in the sky. I guess at that time, at seven years old, I was looking at the sunset in the sky. So maybe she didn't have the observation that I had, but that's the way I saw it, you know. 
And that inspired me to just keep on drawing and eventually I graduated to painting. Whatever I'm doing, I try to be the best I can be of it, you know. I just look at my paintings now as to when I started. The older I get and the more time I can spend with it, the more I can perfect what I'm doing, you know. So it's a growing process. First, let me say good morning to everyone. My dad and I were hand tongers, and we caught the oysters from the bottom of the river, and then we shucked them and prepared them for marketing. And this is just a, an idea of what I felt like when I was working alone in the Chester River. I love the water. I guess I'm born on a water sign, yeah. Well, thank you very much, Alan Johnson. You're quite welcome. You. In both collections, you find black and white having a good time. Like, honestly, as much as the narrative is of racism around, I guess, this county in general, it's not portrayed in any of those photographs. It all seems like working class people just trying to make a living. I had the opportunity to meet Gordon Wallace when he was working at Sumner Hall. Gordon was really involved in the Black Lives Matter protests. He's a fantastic photographer and he caught moments that I don't think any of us really knew were happening. He is doing a deep historical dive into the work conditions and work environment of African Americans in the 20th century in Kent County. So my project is a comparison of two different eras. The first era being Vita Foods, which was a factory located at 800 High Street, and then present day Dixon Val. The unique thing about Vita Foods is they employed at a period, I want to say it was 460 employees, and of that, 380 were women. A large majority of that were African American women. So it's unique to see how jobs and perspectives change for African American women. My mom always talks about her mom, how strong of a woman she was. I would like to assume that interacting with all those women helped her become kind of like this head of household. Even though she was married, but I think she took more of a leadership role in our home because of she was able to communicate with different women throughout the county. All my subjects have been people I've grown up with. That's why everything seems so close and personal when you look at my work, is because I actually know these people. I've broken down a barrier that I don't think most photographers will be able to do when they capture people from Kent County that I can because I grew up with everyone. <laughs> I remember sitting down with my uncle and he was like, hey, that's your grandmother. And I was like, I was speechless, you know? I was, I've literally, that was the first picture I've ever seen of her. So it really brought history into present day for me. It really made it real and living. Everyone's story is unique. If you just embrace where you're from, you can do something through whatever your medium is, whether it's photography, painting, music. There is a way out if you just embrace who you are. This is probably my favorite comparison because you can see the neighborhood around Dixon Valley. Well, 800 High Street. This one in particular I like because my grandmother's front and center. So I thought it'd be cool to show like the classroom she learned and gained her GED in. And the last one, I just thought it was cool to see just a regular working man. I'm assuming this is like a pickle bucket in the back. And then you can see like the hose faucets. And you can also see how technology has changed. Can you tell the story of how you were trying to recreate the photo from the rooftop of 1969 and how you made that happen? At first, I got denied because legally, I wasn't technically supposed to be up there. So. <laughs> but uh, I reached out to Sam and he told me if I just come on a certain day, I'll be okay. So I went there. Uh, you actually go through the building to get up there. There's a door that actually leads right to the roof. I'm assuming that area didn't change one bit just because of the angle of the photograph. So, yeah, kind of just walked out of there. <laughs> Great, thank you, Gordon Wallace. Yeah. I find history that I think is important 
and is often overlooked or history that is commonly known, but it's interpreted a little n incorrectly. And what I try to do is use that artwork that I create to sort of better tell that narrative and get people more interested in that history because I think it's important history that will help us understand the social and political issues that we deal with today. Jason Patterson is probably the newest artist in our community. We had the opportunity to work with him actually as an artist in residence during the school year 2018-2019. He moved here from the Chicago area. His work is extraordinarily detailed portraiture of primarily African Americans from 400 years ago to 40 years ago. I was terrible at school, got terrible grades, except for in art and in history class. History was really what interests me. I didn't have to do a lot of work at it. Like if I was interested in that history, I would just soak it all in, I would remember it. I sort of like, these are the two things that I'm the most interested in and I just kind of combined them. The biggest early influence I had as artist was the figurative work of the German painter Gerhard Richter, who did photo paintings mainly in the 1960s but his specific goal and purpose of the work was photo paintings. Like they're supposed to be a painting of a, of a physical photograph, not necessarily the image in it. So the sort of mindset that I have with photographs is that they don't look real, but we think they look real because they've existed for almost 200 years. I like to sort of manipulate that and think about what that means and how we perceive them. Like I'll do work that it's this blurry image, super distorted, and people will think it's a photograph or think it's so compellingly real. And my thinking is why we think that's real is because it looks like a photograph, not because it looks like a person. Like neoclassical paintings from like the 1820s, to me, that looks more real than any high resolution photograph because the artist wasn't thinking about photographs or they couldn't have because they didn't exist yet. So you have that depth. You, you look like you could put your hand behind their head. In most of my work, normally, it's something that's really relevant to the history or the story that I'm trying to tell. And with this project, it's actually been more about what's the most compelling or interesting images, which it, for me is fun because I usually don't do it that way. What's different about this project, as opposed to just the more critical history that I've worked on in the past, this project has been much a, a lighter and more uh, happier history to sort of celebrate the black history and black community of Kent County. This piece was a part of a project I did at Washington College on the black history of the community. And this is Dorothy Camphor, who was just a prominent African-American woman. And in the article, which you can read here, just talks about her accomplishments and her significance in the community in the 1970s. And I absolutely just loved this image of her. So I was very quick to make it. This piece, John and the Cultural Alliance commissioned for me, this is of Isaac Mason, who wrote a slave narrative, and I highly recommend it. It's a very short read. You can find it online. But he was enslaved in Kent County in Chestertown. And before he escaped north, where he was enslaved was the mansion that is now being converted into the Kent Cultural Alliance's building, which is just a, bl a block away from here. So these two pieces are the pieces that I specifically made for this fellowship just beautiful images of these two men that I really wanted to recreate for this project. And I've designed and built this frame to sort of house these two portraits. What I love about the opportunity for this fellowship and what I love about this, the Chesapeake Heartlands archive, there's so many beautiful images of the African-American community. Some of them, it's absolutely, you should contextualize them because that helps that narrative and tells that story. But some of these images, just these beautiful images is enough. And this is an example of one of them. Um, so I was really excited about making this one. Finally, if you're here at the opening, this was not here because I was not finished with it. Um, <laughs> but this is one of the most amazing finds in the Chesapeake Heartlands archive, the Freedom Ride protest, not to be confused with the Freedom Riders. Um, in 1962, here in Chestertown, on High Street, specifically targeting um, the Bud's restaurant that was there that was a white-only restaurant. And there's this amazing color film footage of protesters, a handful of minutes of beautiful images and important history specific to this community, which is just an amazing thing to have hold of. So I was very eager to make, to make this piece. And there are other stills from that that I plan on continuing. And there's more images in that archive that I definitely will keep making work with. So I'm really grateful that for this opportunity. Great, Jason, thank you so much. Thank you.
So I, I saw the uh, the sticker on your mailbox. I've seen those around town. Is that are those your stickers? Yes. Huh, that's funny that you've seen them around town. That was just basically me getting my name out as a designer, artist, kind of just like planting a seed. Bogey is a really talented digital artist. So he takes existing work or photographs of his own and throws them into a digital context. His piece is about Anton Black. Anton Black grew up right here in Chestertown and was killed by police just one county over a couple of years ago. We're talking really modern, really contemporary, really relevant art, and we're glad to have him as part of this. Well, I always knew how to draw or whatever, but I really just started my artwork during the pandemic. It was me, my wife, and stepdaughter. We needed something to do in the house, so I said, how about we go get some canvases and, and paint? And of course, my painting came out how it came out because, like I said, I know how to draw. She was like, that looks good. She was like, you can sell that or whatever. So um, just it just started off as a hobby. And I just got better and better. And I just said, I, I want to start taking this serious. This piece right here is the first activist piece that I've done. I felt connected to that because I knew the young man that had passed away. I think that young kids should know this story. And just having an example of this story of how you can leave your house and come back alive. Being connected to the um, story, it was kind of hard for real because it was emotional. Uh, I couldn't really attach my creative side to the emotional side at first. And then um, I just thought of how my friend would want his brother represented. I think if I stayed in an emotional state, I wouldn't have been able to create it. My artwork is a uh, therapy for me, so uh, it helped me heal through the process. So the piece that I'm doing for the fellowship starts out with just a picture of the young man at the protest. So what I did was with my iPad Pro, and I'm using an app called Procreate. So I removed the background, then I created an abstract background that coincides with the young man and the sign that he's holding up. I think I'm on the right track. Coming from a small town, it's hard to really get your name out. This is like home. It is my home, I've been here all my life. I think it's getting, it's getting better from the, when the time I grew up around here, because it wasn't really nothing for kids to do, and kids were, were getting in trouble and stuff, uh, including myself. I didn't have my fair share of trouble. But um, that comes from just the lack of not having anything to do and being bored and stuff, you're gonna find mischief somewhere. Really, you can't judge a book by its cover, so uh, you just can't really point the finger at somebody and say, hey, they're a bad guy, or hey, they're doing something wrong by just, like I said, of how they dress or how they look. I actually want to get away from my nine to five, do this full time, not just artwork, but creating in general, make some revenue so I can support my family while I create. I think a lot of potters think about the past. What we work with comes out of the ground. History is a sort of a rigid practice. Clay work is something much more open-ended, but also tactile and something we drink from and eat from. So I think there's this kind of richer relationship with the past. Mike Pugh is a ceramic artist. He's known as an artisan potter. He was trained in the North Carolina functional pottery tradition. The piece that he has created is a juxtaposition of in the 1800s, who got to tell their story of what happened and whose story was never told. My project in the fellowship is a tile mural. It's a diptych. It's two pieces that depict a scene that happened on June 23rd, 1858. One depicts what happened to Harriet Tillerson, a free black woman working as a washerwoman in Chestertown. And the other is for James Lamb Bowers, who is a Quaker farmer who um, actually lived in the house where we live here. James Bowers was tricked to come out of his house to ostensibly help some people with a broken carriage, and he was ambushed. A mob of 30 men from town who were masked, they stripped him, beat him, and tarred and feathered him. And they weren't satisfied. They went back to Chestertown, and they found Harriet Tillerson, and they did the same thing with her. 
for James Lamb Bowers, because he was a white man with land and well respected, he actually came back to file assault charges and named his assaulters. And this newspaper story circulated all across the country two years before the Civil War began. James told a story. For Harriet, she was sent out of state and we don't know what happened to her. She entirely disappeared off the historic record. She was never able to tell her story. The reason I chose this topic was because it's not well known, and it, it's a story that needs to be told. Those two people were a catalyst that ended up with people brawling in the streets of Chestertown, sorting out where they stood on this question of whether Harriet and James really should have been tarred and feathered or not, and whether they were doing the right thing or not. That's powerful, that's our story. When I look into the archive, that's what I see. I mean, at first I didn't, I didn't think that was for me to tell. I had a, an enormous insecurity thinking, well, this isn't for me. I don't belong here telling these stories. And then I, over time, I realized that this is for all of us. This is for all of us to be in that sacred space, to have this dialogue that we're having, to learn. And if I listen and I try to listen hard, that I can become a better person over time. And that's what it's about, right? And, So just to be clear, these are tile murals. They're intended to one day go on a wall somewhere. That's why they're wired to this chicken wire. Um, eventually, they'll be permanently put on some wall, hopefully a public wall where people can engage with it. Please touch it. It's, it's stoneware. It's made to be embraced. Um, the tar and feathers become the sort of metaphor. You can see the black and, of course, this wreath of feathers, which creates sort of a, a supernova of strength and wisdom. Those of you who know quilts, the sort of quilt in the back is the flying geese, which is believed to be an underground railroad metaphor for uh, directing people toward the north in the springtime following the geese back. She's also pointing toward the guinea hen, and we're in an agricultural area, and everyone knows the guinea hen is sort of the siren of the barnyard, warning the chickens that danger is around so that they can make smart decisions. I hope you come up here and touch it. I hope you come here and read the text. Last night was so emotional as, as, as local folks were coming up and pulling out names from the narrative. I mean, he actually published their names in newspapers, including Judge Chambers. <laughs> you know, he was, he was going against the status quo of the day. And I hope that you come and explore that. Thank you, Mike. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please welcome First Lady Yubi Hogan. Good evening, everyone. I'm so thrilled to be here. We believe in the transformative power of the arts, and we believe in access to arts. These five artists are expressing their forms of art and telling our story by bringing a lot of their form of art to share with the greater community. The concept behind Chesapeake Heartland is that basically Kent County is the center of the universe. Yes. yes. <laughs> Okay, okay, well, uh, maybe that's a little bit overstating. Like, maybe not the center of the universe, but really the center or a center in so many ways of four centuries of African-American history and culture. African-American history, as I was taught, was not a part of American history, separate and unequal. But history is not complete until the complete story is told. It's important to preserve African-American history because if you don't, it's lost. History can be a very powerful thing for any generation as long as it's shown in the right medium. This is my first piece tied to African-American history, but I hope to do more. Seeing the black community come together with the Chesapeake Heartlands Archive, the call for images and photos and albums, and being able to see the history through the actual people who lived it, and then also their relatives and their descendants. Stories, sometimes very difficult stories that have created generations of trauma, can be leveraged into a, a wisdom that we can all benefit from. My perspective on African American history has deepened. I went deeper on topics that I just vaguely knew in the past. I don't know if you've ever had the situation where you were not able to tell your story, where you were not welcome to the table because people didn't want to hear from you. It's fearful too. You know what I mean? You don't know if you're going to come back home alive or not. We've survived. 
and we will continue to survive. We were fighting for survival then, back when King was there, just as things are going on today. We're still fighting for survival. When you understand how rich our culture is, you do not want to lose it. This community has really welcomed me and my partner, and we've really loved it. It's a shared story. It's a story that has grown and been told from elder to, to young family, literally over nearly 400 years. I never felt that that was something that I would be interacting with in a deep, sacred way. Have you ever heard the statement, one picture is worth a thousand words? There it is right there. You can speak to more people through art than you can with words. Every piece that's captured is a memory for someone. You can be placed in the photographer's eyes at that moment. Sometimes I start out with a blank canvas and sometimes I just start painting and the journey tells itself. Anyone can be considered an artist. I didn't pick up a camera until three years ago now and now I'm in a situation to do things like this through a lens. I think that, that my pottery is my gift, you know. I have things to say, I have a lot to say, and, and I'm just getting started. I hope that it bring people closer together and realize that we all have one creator and everybody has two eyes, a nose, and a mouth. And when we get up, we put our pants on the same way. I hope they can see life through my lens. I don't see myself ever stopping, it's just a part of me. In the future, who knows? But my hope is that it'll live on and be something that outlives me and continues informing people and providing some wisdom that even today we need to hear so much. Strive, look inward and not outward, because it's what's inside that counts. I am Bogey. My name is Jason Patterson. My name is Mike Pugh. My name is Gordon Wallace. My name is Alan Johnson, and I'm proud to be. And I'm proud to be. And I'm, I'm happy, happy to be a K-Cultural Just be honest.